Hey there, welcome to Takeaway with Sam Okus, a podcast from Nations Restaurant News. I am Sam Okus, Editor-in-Chief here at NRN, and this is the show where I give you an all-access pass to the restaurant industry's most influential decision makers. This week, I'm talking with Jared Galbit, the co-founder and CEO of Bodega Taqueria y Tequila, a Miami-based concept that has grown to 10 locations between South Florida and Chicago over the last decade. Bodega has a really interesting business model where it is a fast casual taqueria in the front and in the back it is a full service bar and lounge. And with this model, Jared and his team have been able to connect with a wide variety of customers all looking for different kinds of experiences from Bodega. Jared joined the podcast to talk about how Bodega is thoughtfully and creatively meeting the expectations of all of those customers and about the potential of alcohol service in the fast casual category. In this conversation, you will learn more about why you should consider a calling card for your concept, why non-traditional expansion requires careful alignment with other brands and partners, and how you, how patience and discipline will ultimately pay off as you build your brand. Jumping now into my interview with Bodega co-founder and CEO, Jared Galbit. Also, don't forget to stick around after the interview as I will share my six takeaways from this discussion, actionable insights that you can take with you on the go. Okay, I'm here with Jared Galbit, the co-founder and CEO of Bodega Taqueria y Tequila. Jared, thanks for joining me today. Uh, thanks for having me on, Sam. Look, uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. So, um, Jared, for those who don't know about this brand out of South Florida, uh, tell us a little bit about it. What's the one minute elevator pitch you've got for this brand? Well, we're uh, myself uh, and my partner, Keith. Uh, we were just local guys, grew up in Miami Beach. Uh, we were in the hotel business for a while and kind of got some good opportunities at uh, opening up some restaurants and bars in Miami. And Bodega was really kind of our third or fourth concept that we had opened up. Um, but it quickly kind of became our most successful one. Uh, it was really a unique concept. It was a, a fast, casual up front with a lounge in the back. So we have a, it's a Mexican taqueria up front. You go up to an Airstream, you order your food. Uh, they're usually small 800 to 1,000 square foot, uh, uh, you know, kind of areas up front. Um, and you kind of get that experience, that authentic Mexican street style tacos up front. Uh, but when you want to kind of amp it up a little bit, you go through a porta potty door and uh, there's a big lounge in the back, which you can get. Uh, we have craft cocktails. Uh, it's great happy hours, lounge service later at night for bottle service. So it's a it's a pretty unique concept with a fast casual and a lounge kind of combined. Nothing screams quality like a porta potty door. I got to know why, yeah. why the porta potty door? <laughs> You know what? A lot of people ask us that, and it really wasn't, uh, you know, w when we designed this, we were obviously much younger in our career and our thought process weren't as, you know, kind of, I guess they were just different. You know, we were kind of going with the flow a little bit. So a lot of it, as we're developing this, the design really kind of just occurred on site and we thought about cool ways. We wanted to have a speakeasy in the back and one of our partners and all of us at the time were like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to put a porta potty door, like almost joking around. And uh, it really, uh, we decided to put it on there and we walked through, there's like empty toilets and some mop rooms and fun stuff. And <laughs> you, you really kind of, I'm really not expecting, uh, you know, not expecting to walk into a bar. So it worked uh, and we've kind of rolled with it ever since. Yeah, I want to break down some of the the language you use for everything because I, th I think it's all fascinating when you put it together. But but I know that one of the things is you mentioned the lounge, but you also call this a speakeasy, right? So there's there's some secrecy to it, right? Do, do you how heavy do you promote that lounge in the back? Is that sort of a members only? You have to be in the know, or are you putting that in in front of the guests and inviting them to come back? I think we're really putting it in front of the guests. I think the speakeasy component really comes uh, from, I guess, that 10 second experiential uh, walkthrough, you know, from the front to the back, because out of all our locations that are, are let's say, our full concept, um, you really walk in feeling like you're in, you're going to get street tacos and you're in a restaurant, um, mm -hmm. you know, a fast casual restaurant, but it's usually whether it's a little hallway, it's a porta potty door, you're walking from a restaurant to something kind of not knowing where you're going. Uh, and then usually the entrance to the lounge is somewhat just not apparent. You got to find it a little bit. 
And we really, you know, we we're kind of really some of the first people to do that. We started that really almost 11 years ago, 12 years ago when we conceptualized um, Bodega. So it's really been a part of our brand, our design, and really what guests expect as they're going from Bodega to Bodega in different cities. Yeah, and as I mentioned, I mean, there are so many terms here that that would seemingly sort of be at, at odds with each other. Because as I was researching Bodega, I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. Because again, speakeasy lounge, but also fast casual, you know, like those those things typically don't go together. But I guess what I am wondering is, what's the intended service model? What What's the, I guess, experience you hope most of your customers are there to get? So... We offer, you know, and it's funny you're saying that because we're always, we're always talking about that, right? You know, so as, as the brand's developing and we're going into new cities, you know, we really let the customer and our guests kind of choose what bodega experience they want. Um, so a lot of people, we have a very loyal lunch crowd. You know, they're coming mm -hmm. in there to pick up their food at our locations or either grab and go. They quickly get tacos. Uh, we have a great happy hour crowd up front, but then there's also a great, happy hour crowd that likes to go to the back. Um, and then we have a great after dinner crowd, you know, likes to be there. And then there's our lovely, you know, like our amazing late night crowd that likes to go there and party, you know, sometimes till 5 a.m. in some of the cities that we're allowed to. So, you know, for us, it's really, we let the customer kind of choose what level of experience that they want. And I think we are a unique concept in that, you know, more and more, I think what you're seeing in the industry and the successful concepts is that people um, people want high quality food quickly, yeah, right. Um, and those are the ones that are doing well. Uh, and they also want a really good craft cocktail quickly. Um, right. So you know, and they want an experience and and some good entertainment. So I think that's where we've really fallen into a good uh, niche that like you know we offer both of those, and I think that's what really makes our concept unique to our customers. Right. What is the lunch dinner split? And then what is the number of tickets that have a cocktail as part of it, if you know that? So I would say lunch from our food perspective is probably about, you know, it, it's really broken into three, you know, three because we're open up late usually at these concepts. Sure. So I would say it's about uh, 35%, you know, probably it, it's pretty even between lunch and dinner. And then we have a good, you know, 35% each and we have a good 30% of uh, food comes late night. Very surprising. So we are, yeah. you know, that 2 a.m. to sometimes 5 a.m. or it could be 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. We get not only a great, uh, a very big rush from our late night crowd from our guests, but also surrounding nightlife, um, uh, you know, surrounding nightlife, you know, venues in different cities. Because like what's better than a taco or burrito at like? 2 a.m. after you've had a lot of tequila or, you know, vodka. <laughs> sign on that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do, do you have a lot of then cocktails? Like you mentioned, some people come in for happy hour at lunchtime. Like, I guess what I'm getting at is you seem to be a really cocktail forward brand. But as you mentioned, lots of people coming in for these great tacos at lunchtime, too. Do you feel like people come in for the tacos and then add the cocktail or they come in for the cocktail and add the taco? Uh. So I, I, it's, it's a good question. Um, and it's not, you, you know, for us, it's really, it, it's all location dependent, right? So we mm -hmm. all have the same offerings everywhere. But if you notice, you come to our South Beach location, you know, we have a great loyal crowd that comes to the food, but also whether it's our tourist crowd, they're coming to get, you know, frozen margaritas with an extra shot, you know, in the middle of the day. Um, so I think there's some people that obviously, depending upon, you know, location and what type of guest it is, you know, some are coming for the cocktails first and some are coming for our, our, maybe our local residents, you know, people that are really our locals that come back to back are coming for the food first, um, mm. which, you know, we'll talk about has been kind of one of our, our bigger growth stories. Um, but definitely as we go to happy hour, you know, in the back lounge, I think that is obviously, you know, from 5 p.m. maybe on in that lounge, it's more drink driven and then uh, food attached to it. Got it. So if I walk in for lunch and I just walk up to the counter to order some tacos, I can get any of the cocktails from the from the fast casual counter for lunch if I wanted to. Uh, so for lunch, they're limited in terms. Of, so we have the biggest seller is our frozen margarita. So we have a bunch okay. of different flavors. And then you can get a little kind of extra shot of tequila if you want, like, a, let's say a little floater. And then we offer our bottled cocktails as well. 
Um, so we, we try to keep it, you know, limited during, you know, lunch period there where it's either, you know, the margarita or if you want to get the frozen margarita. And then as we open up the back bar, it's more of a full service uh, liquor concept. Got it. Yeah, I guess where I'm getting at with all this, and I mentioned to you before we hit record, I'm really fascinated by, you know, a fast casual with alcohol service. Um, you know, I feel like there was a momentum for that model before COVID. And then and then during the pandemic, obviously, there was a lot of change too, particularly when it came to alcohol service to go. And a lot of states started changing their laws to allow for alcohol service to go. And you just made that comment a bit ago that people want cocktails quickly. So I'm wondering if you can talk about this concept of you know, a fast casual restaurant with clearly a very um, thought out, high quality cocktail menu, uh, speed of service is, is inevitably going to be a part of your promise to customers. So so tell me a little bit about, you know, how you position these two things like fast casual is all about speed and convenience. But then you also have the quality, uh, you know, of your cocktails. H how do you make that work? And, and then how do you really kind of position, I guess, the brand to your customer base? Well, you know, it's, you know, we talked a little about it earlier, you know, all, all the customers, they want, they want their food quickly, they want their drinks quickly. And what we've really been working on, you know, before actually you mentioned a pandemic, uh, we did not have bottled cocktails. Um, okay. You know, for us, it was the just the frozen margaritas. And that's what we served up front. And people could also get beer and wine. And, you know, we had the canned, uh, canned cocktails as well from different, you know, different suppliers and vendors. But really, what we what we noticed is that, People were fine with that, but they also wanted to kind of experience bodega a little bit more in their craft cocktails. So hmm. we really started putting a focus on our own bottled cocktails, which actually you can get two drinks out of, which is nice. Um, so we serve with a cup of ice um, and we they really kind of took off. Um, so now we're kind of really investing more in that to as we as we kind of grow to putting more of those bottle cocktails out at each and every location that allows because you know i think like you, you know for consumers unless sometimes unless it's really in front of them you know quickly and they can see it you know we try to really put these bottled cocktails and the drinks and the beers right in their um you know right in front of them so when they see it they can you know it's kind of a yeah sure i love a beer <laughs> yeah, sure. I'd love a bottle cocktail because sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going in intending, you know, right. to have this, you know, to have a Impulse cocktail, pipe. but it's yeah. nice when you see it right in front of you, you go, yeah, nice cold beer looks great or a nice margarita. Yeah. Sure. I'll have one. Why not? Gets me every time and dangerous yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Right, you mentioned, you mentioned growth. Let's talk about that. Cause you guys have six locations in South Florida. You've expanded to Chicago. Um, you know, when I think about Miami, I mean, you guys are right at home in Miami for a taqueria. I mean, there's one of the greatest cities for tacos and cocktails, a cocktail bar. Moving to Chicago, tell me about the process. Why Chicago? And, and what's that process been like about, you know, in translating this brand to the Midwest? So it's actually uh, pretty cool. I just wanted to, if you include some of our stadium locations, we're actually at 10 right now, which is was kind of like okay. an exciting, a kind of an exciting number. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, for us and we, you know, we'll talk a little bit more. We also have some stadiums that we're, you know, like a part of. Um, but Chicago for us, it was kind of a cool story. Um, you know, background for us is I grew, I kind of lived in Chicago maybe for five or six years. I was during, we, uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier, I was in hotels. So I was a general manager at a hotel up there. Uh, worked up okay. there, really um, loved the city, loved everything about it. It really was actually um, a nice influence for us uh on our food um there was i used to fall in love with some of the uh mexican uh you know kind of uh, almost mexican bodegas you know that were up there that would serve these you know tacos on a spit and it was really authentic and i loved it um so you know when we were expanding throughout south florida we knew we definitely wanted to expand throughout florida that was a no-brainer <laughs> we wanted to be everywhere throughout florida and we're still working on that expansion but we knew at one point that we're like, hey, if we want to bring this brand national, we obviously have to take that jump and pick the right city to go to. And I really, you know, kind of, you know, heading up that expansion really felt comfortable in Chicago because I knew they appreciated good food. To me, the uh, nightlife scene was somewhat underserved. Um, and I felt like we were we had such a loyal base of Chicago that when they come down to Miami, 
Um, they used to always beg us to kind of go up to Chicago and, and, and open up and we'd do well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were right. Um, you know, we kind of, you know, it was our first city that we talked about, uh, talked about going to, and I went there during COVID. Um, and we looked at a space in West Loop and Fulton Market area. And we decided, you know, if we're going to give it a shot, this has got to be it. And um, kind of the rest is history. It's now our number two uh, store in the brand, you know, oh, wow. in West Loop. And we just opened up in River North. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, when you think about that, West Loop, River North, these are the two it neighborhoods, I guess you would say, of Chicago. It, it, does it necessitate, does Bodega necessitate kind of that? hot nightlife kind of neighborhood. I know you're looking into DC and Nashville expansion as well. Are, are you targeting these neighborhoods where the nightlife is, is really a critical component of your business? So I'm going to mention a, a few critical things that, you know, we, we look at when we're looking sure. at sites and they're probably going to be, you're going to be like, yeah, those are, yeah, I get it. No brainers, you know, <laughs> but sure. we really like to look at uh, dense uh, residential, dense office traffic, um, and, you know, potential trends like that into nighttime lounge, you know, like mm -hmm. speakeasy. So now you're going to say, of course, everyone wants that. But, you know, what, what really that means is for us, we look at, we like, we want to have the office there in, re in residential for a great lunch period. Then we want to kind of move that into a great happy hour and dinner, which is really the main kind of residential component in office leaving. And then at nighttime to make sure there's activity of those people wanting to go out and spend money in the lounge and, you know, go out late night. Um, so, you know, we really look at markets that kind of meet all three of those criteria. Um, and sometimes it's not, you know, we find them, we check all the boxes in the market and then we can't find the space. So we just have to be patient, you know, and, and hoping that space has come up. But, um, you know, we like to make sure that we get a good base of our lunch business going into the night. And that's kind of our simple formula in our mind. Got it. Uh, all right, so no, and I know you guys are um, uh, trying a new format, and, and I'm, I'm quoting here from a release about your expansion, um, and I, again, using some language I find really interesting. So two things that this mentions is that your, I think your Chicago, latest Chicago location, all-day neighborhood bar format, and also says open bar floor plan. I'm wondering if you could break down those for me. What What is the vibe uh, of this new prototype compared with what Bodega has been historically? Yeah, so internally we we call this kind of like the bar. Um, it's okay. also like our inside name is called our hybrid. So what had happened is when we were going in expansion mode, um, we obviously had a set parameters of what we wanted. I said, all right, I want four to six thousand square feet of a you know space, and that's going to be our big bodega. Um, but then you know it was very difficult to find to meet all those three criteria I mentioned of four to six thousand feet, get the deal that we want. But I loved certain neighborhoods and locations. And, you know, for me, I, I would look at spaces that are maybe two to 3,000 feet. And it, I said, why can't we fit in here? Or why <laughs> can't we bring the bodega to this neighborhood? Because I think it's important that we're a part of it. So we started really thinking internally, how, how can we give that same bodega experience in a different format and maybe something that will help us expand to more residential markets. And that's where we kind of came up with this concept, you know, the bar that we now have the bar side and the taqueria together. Um, okay. So it's basically that lounge and the taqueria in one space in a smaller format that's two to 3,000 feet. And we have a really great design that allows the fast casual component to kind of occur in that space, but also separate the bar which we found very important because it's one mm -hmm. thing you don't want to, you know, be sitting in a, you know, a bar and all of a sudden uh, it's, you know, people are asking, can I get more salsa or spilling stuff everywhere? Or it's a quick service restaurant. Like, you know, we kind of wanted, we, we made sure with the design of this, that you could have that experience, but also if you're in the bar, you feel like you're in the bodega bar. So again, sure. that was letting the customer say, Hey, what experience do I want when I'm going to bodega? And this has allowed us to enter in new markets that we never really thought that we would. And so far, the two that we have open uh, in River North and Coral Gables have been doing uh, incredible. And we're very happy with it. So no porta potty door. There no porta potty on one of them. I think there is a component of a porta potty door, but it's not to the back lounge. <laughs> I mean, that's a part of the brand, right? You can't get rid of yeah. the porta potty altogether. <laughs> yeah. How very ironic. Design. 
Yeah. So, so I saw you guys are, are um, playing with kiosks too. So is, is kiosk ordering a big part of the experience you guys are rolling into Bodega? Yes. And, you know, we're, we're always looking at ways to do things better, faster. Um, you know, we talked about to get the food to the food or drinks to our, our guests uh, in, a, in a better way. And, you know, I, I try, you know, I always try to take inspiration. I look at from the big guys um, and see what they're doing and how it can help work with our brand. And I think now more and more you see the uh, increase in kind of adaptation of these kiosks and the, the different bigger brands. And you see the results that they're reporting from them. And we said, you know what, we, we need to start moving in that direction because I feel, you know, for customers, sometimes some people love it, some people don't. But what it does do, I think it allows the customer and our guests to be a little bit more free with their ordering. Um, mm. You know, it allows them to really kind of take their time. They don't feel rushed. Um, and, you know, with that process, a lot of the times it, it really uh, results in increased, you know, average check size, you know, for each of these customers. Because, you know, why not? You're looking at it, you know, especially if you're ordering a taco or nachos and be like, why not? Let me add on extra this or extra that, or why not a chips and guacamole or a margarita? You know, so these are, we, we found the kiosks to be um, very successful in the units that we have them in, and we're going to be launching them throughout all of our locations, but they are, um, they're definitely for everyone out there. It, it's a learning curve, you know, for all the customers, mm -hmm. but you know, just the advice you will get through that learning curve as long as the team is trained properly and, and, works with the guests and you'll see then your loyal customers will get used to it and it'll be um, a very part of the normal operations. So, so to that end, describe to me your the hospitality component of things and your deployment of your labor. Are you really trying to emphasize the hospitality provided at the lounge, whereas the fast casual nature of the taco bar is, you know, try to keep that limited, especially with kiosks. I imagine you can kind of limit how many team members you have up front. Tell me about how you how you deploy the employees to emphasize the hospitality. Yeah, so it, it really it, it goes down to you know kind of changes a little bit per location, but it's there, there's always an emphasis on hospitality even with the kiosk. You're going to find moments that guests you know require a little extra attention you know from our you know team members and help, and so we're always there to assist them. And you know our managers step in, or expo you know will step in and kind of help because it's part of that whole area of uh, the food delivery. And so we're always, we're always providing on the food side. And then on the, you know, kind of beverage side and these, let's say these new concepts of the bar that we're talking about, you know, guests can also choose to have full service, which are able to sit down at a table and they can order off a QR code. And then they have a server that will come and serve them. They'll bring them their food or get them drinks. Um, so we really, the hospitality is there on both sides, but we also offer a little bit of full service, you know, for our guests coming in the bar. And then if you just want that quick service, there's still the ability of our team to help you out and, and provide uh, the level of hospitality that you would expect in Bodega. I love the sort of choose your own adventure nature of, yeah. of what you're providing. You can sort of pick what, what experience you want. Um, so you mentioned something, you know, adapting the model according to the real estate that is available to you. And, and what it makes me think of is how it seems to me you really have kind of two distinct brands here. You have a cocktail bar brand and you have a taco brand, which obviously go very well together. But have you explored the notion of expansion with these things individually? Like if you get a 1,500 square foot space that can't miss, do you pop the taqueria in there and not do the cocktail bar or vice versa? I'm just curious if you thought about these as two brands or if they're always supposed to be one brand. So I think the overarching brand will always be Bodega Taqueria Tequila, but we're starting to brand each of them kind of a little bit separately. You know, what we find is anytime we enter into a new city, people expect to have that full Bodega experience initially. So as we're going into new cities, really our first one will be the big one that you'll see at South Beach or some variation of that with a lounge in the back. And then as we expand to different um, areas of that city, we will provide the bar concept slash hybrid, which will, um, you know, be, I, I guess you can say there'll be more of those throughout the city, but having one main core one with the lounge in the back. 
Gotcha. Kind of a hub and spoke model, if you will. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Got it. It's so the exact again, term I know again. We use internally. It's a, okay. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. It, and it, it's it, that's cropping up more and more. I love this model. I've heard a few other folks uh, mention this, and I think it's really smart. So, you, I, like I mentioned before, you guys have talked about DC and Nashville are, are anticipated to open. Same idea. Then, do you come in? Do you open the hub? Do you go with that big location, and then? every market you go into, I, I suppose inevitably you kind of have to go big on the market to justify the team you build out there. Is that kind of the plan? Yes. And that's the plan right now. I think as the concept of the bar and you know, the, the hybrid concept becomes more defined, I'm also not fully opposed to going into new markets with a couple of those and not having the full one. Um, but, you know, right now that is the plan and those markets are currently um, for our uh, DC location and for our natural location, those will be the full concepts that you know our our guests and customers uh, have experienced in the past. We're putting together. Got it. You mentioned before the arena uh, presence that you guys are in a couple of arenas. Explain that to me. I mean, when I think about stadiums and arenas today, of course, we all know they they really up to the. Uh, anti on quality, uh, you know, by and large, brought in a lot more local operators. But I also think to myself, you know, a stadium is is inherently going to be necessitate very fast service, um, which, I, of course, you've talked about sort of the speed, uh, the need for speed with Bodega. But tell me about how you can put this operation into a stadium and make it work. So we work, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't something at the time we anticipated doing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we were pretty, we became close with, you know, our first one was at the, uh, it's called the Kaseya Center now before it was American Airlines Arena. Um, and we got introduced to the Levy restaurant team there and uh, the Heat. And we, you know, had to, we were doing events with them and became kind of close. And they said, hey, we'd love to open up a bodega um, at the arena. We think it'd be great. We're upgrading our food and beverage. And we said, we'd love to be a part of it. Um, from what started as one, we got up to four or five of them. Uh, you know, at, at the location, and it just became, we became one of their largest uh, vendors there. Uh, and a lot of that came with, you know, being really good um, communicative partners with each other, you know, because a lot of it is like what we talked about is their team, you know, that is there helping execute this product, you know, on site. So it's a lot of, you know, working together, training, um, and they've been wonderful partners. And as we expand into different arenas, it's the same same concept, you know, people, um, we have a lot of loyalists for our food. And we said, what better way in a kind of captured audience, you know, some of these arenas have 150 to 200 events a year to really expose people to our food uh, and our concepts. And we've really got it dialed in with the teams of the different arenas and stadiums. And um, we're doing a 9,000 square foot um, venue at um, Hard Rock Stadium in Miami with the Dolphins, wow. uh, which is actually going to be a full blown uh, bodega uh, for a lot of, so it's gonna be a lot of fun there um, in the club section. Uh, so we're, so we're excited. We're, we're seeing more and more of these opportunities. Um, and as long as you know, it's the right partnership with the food and beverage operators there, we find it to be very successful and great opportunities, you know, for our, uh, you know, brands to get more exposure to a bigger audience. Sure. Yeah, I recently spoke with um, Claudia Lascano, the CEO of David Chang's Fuku brand, and um, she said that they uh, were at the U.S. Open. They served the U.S. Open uh, in September, and over a month, they did $2 million. <laughs> and so, you know, just talking about, because, like, these places aren't open every day, but, you know, she was saying, like, it justifies based on the volume you get purely in those events. I imagine you experienced the same thing. So, one, I contributed to at least two of those chicken sandwiches during the U.S. Open. <laughs> Uh, and they're they were really great. good. Uh, you can tell her <laughs> yeah. uh, they, they yeah. were very good. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, it doesn't always um, work out from what I've heard, you know, in some of those stories. Um, but again, it's all finding the right partners, finding, making sure that it aligns with your brand um, and that you want to be in there. I mean, you don't want to be in an empty stadium or a team that's not doing well. You know, then it kind of looks down on your brand as well. But for big events Which like that, we're also part of. Miami Open and F1 uh, were consistently the number one vendor at both of those. So the F1 mm. Miami, we have over 6,000 square foot um, bodega there that now we just added on our second, third and fourth location on the campus 
Um, so we'll be really a big presence uh, when that race comes around again. And that be, that is really due to our kind of successful partnership with the Dolphins and with their team working with our team and kind of executing our food on a high level and our drinks. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting. I would have never really thought about sort of the importance of the brand alignment between a, a sports team and arena with the brand itself. Because in my head, I just think, well, people in a stadium need to eat. You know, there are local places you can get to come on in. But but from the perspective of the operator, as you, I mean, you want to make sure you can align with the brand of the team. What does the team represent? Who are the owners? Who are the players? What is the success rate? Like, how do you process when a, a partnership makes itself available? What are the things you're assessing when you go into an arena deal like this? Because I, I, I guess in my head, it would have been pretty simplistic, like, well, yeah, sure. Let's go do that. But you, you've got to really got to think that through, huh? So I think it's even more, and let me kind of expand the answer a little bit. Sure. I think that is applicable to everything that you're doing. I mm -hmm. think as a new brand, you know, like we are, and I would say actually we're a little bit more, you know, we've been around for 11 years. I still call us a new brand, but we're, we, we just really kind of gone fast forward with our expansion recently. It is important with everything that you do, especially in the growth period, to really make sure that you align yourself with other brands, landlords, partnerships, license agreements, whatever the case may be, that really align with your customers. Meaning, you know, I, I, I don't know, you, you don't want to, you know, I don't want to be sitting next to, uh, or, you know, have a, a concept next to another concept that's completely off or be in a shopping center that doesn't, you know, align has different tenants than that would my customers that would be there. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important in anything that you're doing, especially in expanding brand to be, you know, really thoughtful in making sure that the people that are around you, similar customers, like the brands kind of share similar values, the landlords, the licensees. And we found that to be very, um, uh, you know, very, a, a big important part of our expansion, our success. I imagine that requires a lot of patience. It, it's, it, it really is a huge amount of patience in that, you know, because you get, there's a lot of times that you get very excited about potential partnerships, potential, you know, new properties, but, you know, you, you you have to be, especially in growth mode, you have to be patient, you have to be smart. You know, there's also the, you know, talk about the kind of deployment of your capital. You know, you want to do everything quickly, but you got to make sure you're deploying it in the right spaces and, and the ways that you know those units are going to be successful. So we're, we're, we're very thoughtful in that manner. Um, we are, you know, kind of, we're a family owned company. Um, mm -hmm. so for us, it's everyone's, you know, we're all kind of a little bit of a real estate background, you know, to some extent, and we're very, you know, we're patient. We know things will come to us when it's ready. Um, and, uh, when they are ready, we're ready to move forward quickly. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, Jared. So segueing out of that, my last question for you, you mentioned you're 11 years in on this bodega brand. You're, you're expanding lots of exciting things ahead of you. What would you say is one of the biggest lessons you've learned in 11 years of running this brand that you could offer our audience? If you could just boil it down to kind of your biggest piece of advice. Oh God, there's so many, uh, there's so many <laughs> things, but you know, the, the process I think of expanding a brand, uh, it's hard to explain to people unless that they've been through it. Um, it's not the easiest. Um, right. But I think that if you you believe in your concept, you believe in what you have, and you stay disciplined with it, whether it's good or bad, um, continue to kind of keep moving forward with it, you know, and you'll know eventually it'll be, it'll get to the right place. There's a lot of times that you look back and I know a lot of people are like, this is so tough, this is hard, you know, whether they have issues with their team or not. But, you know, if you've got something good, stay disciplined, keep the foot on the gas pedal, keep moving forward. And, you know, that type of mentality will be contagious to your team. I've always said the best type of culture is a winning culture. Um, and, you know, people love winning. So, you know, if they see that you're pushing forward and pushing forward towards a win, they will join along with you. So 
um, stay positive, keep it moving forward, and uh, you will be successful. That's fantastic advice. Uh, Jared Galbit, the co-founder and CEO of Bodega Taqueria y Tequila. Jared, thanks for taking some time today. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Sam, for having us on and look forward to having you next time you're in Florida or Chicago to one on, on Bodega. I'm there. Count on it. Thanks, Jared. That was my interview with Bodega co-founder and CEO, Jared Galbit. So what should you learn from this interview? Here are my six takeaways. My first takeaway is that you should consider a calling card for your concept. What I mean by that is a signature element, a design, for example, uh, within your restaurant uh, that is, exists all around all of your restaurants and is kind of a fun, tongue-in-cheek, playful thing to tie all of your restaurants together and be that little wink or nudge to your customers. You probably know by now what I'm referring to from this interview. Yes, I'm talking about the porta potty door. Uh, this was so fascinating because when talking about Bodega, when preparing for this interview and looking at what this concept's all about, of course, it's got these great high quality vibes of a taqueria lounge, um, you know, really emphasizing high quality in the, the food and the bar. <laughs> and then Jared mentions the porta potty door, which de definitely caught me by surprise. Um, but what I love about this is that it's quirky, it's fun, and they kept that consistent through most of the rest of their locations because it's just something fun and playful that customers know them for. What's a calling card that you can incorporate to your own restaurant? What is a, a, des a design uh, or aesthetic component um, that they'll all notice? Maybe it's something, of course, with the menu or, or maybe it's a drink, um, something that ties together all of your locations and can be this playful thing that customers look forward to, especially for your loyal customers who might check out new locations. They're probably going to look for that, that calling card. They want to see that signature at play and see how you incorporated it into a new location. I think it's really clever um, and something that uh, more restaurateurs should consider as they grow. My second takeaway is that your guests all have different ways that they choose to experience your brand. Something that caught my eye about Bodega in the first place and why I wanted to do this interview is I love this notion that it is sort of two businesses in one, or it's at least two distinct experiences in one. And the, the first is that quick, convenient, fast, casual experience in the taqueria. And the second one is that relaxing sit and stay a while full service bar experience of the lounge and how those two things go together and are packaged together as they grow. Uh, as Jared said, you know, this is a business where both of those elements are important to their growth. Um, but he's recognizing that, you know, some people want to come in for a quick lunch. Some people want to come in for happy hour. Some people want to combine those experiences. And he also talked about how with the hospitality, they have different experiences available. So they're uh, exploring kiosks in a number of their locations now. And so they offer that to some guests. You can come order at the kiosks, go order at the counter. He said that you can also sit at a table and order from a QR code, or you can walk through the porta potty door and go back to the lounge and just grab a drink. All of these are different experiences that Bodega offers, and it's recognizing that it can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and it's meeting them in all of those different places. It's not necessary for every restaurant. You might just be a for burgers and fries concept, call it what it is, and own it. But if you have a bigger menu, certainly if you have a bar, if you've got a big uh, f uh, footprint where you know you have opportunities for different actual physical experiences, Think about the ways you can meet all of those different customers where they want to be. Um, how can you create these experiences for them? My third takeaway is that alcohol may be an untapped opportunity for many fast casuals. Uh, that's no secret. Alcohol has been in the fast casual space for many, many years, if not decades. Um, but it's still something to consider as fast casual continues to be one of the hottest categories out there, certainly as new brands jump into the space. Um, consider how alcohol can play a role. Now, yes, it comes with all kinds of uh, difficulties and all kinds of complexities that you have to sort of work through. Um, and, and it might be a little bit harder to scale a concept that where alcohol is an important part of it. But I love what Bodega is doing with their alcohol program. I mean, for starters, just the fact that they have a bar and lounge as part of the concept means that you you are opening up the you know evening and late night uh, day parts for business and giving a totally different experience than a traditional fast casual taqueria might offer. 
But even for those folks who are coming to just get the tacos, you know, the innovation in the bar is so interesting. They have these house-made cocktails that they're bottling, which I think is a really interesting idea. And as Jared said, you know, that kind of changed people's notion of how they wanted to come and experience Bodega. Um, There's all kinds of ways in which you can use alcohol to your benefit, to create a unique experience, to create obviously unique uh, menu options. And it might be time for you to consider it if you've been leaning that direction, because as we've talked about, uh, you know, a lot in the last year or two, there are a lot of customers out there that, yes, they might do delivery sometimes, but they still want some place to go. They still want to have an uh, experience, a physical in-person experience. And for many of them, alcohol is going to play a role in that. How do you fit that into your menu and your experience in a creative way that's fresh that's unique to your brand, if you can figure that out as Bodega has, it can really be an exciting opportunity for your future growth. My fourth takeaway is that a smaller secondary prototype can help you fill out a market. Um, I've had a few conversations recently about the hub and spoke model, um, which is nothing new, but I think really interesting that more people are talking about taking this approach. Um, Because essentially, um, the hub and spoke model you have a centralized location in a market that might be a bigger location. You know, it might be uh, a bigger menu. It might be certainly a bigger footprint. Maybe you have multiple sort of elements going on, like, for example, with Bodega, with their taqueria and lounge. And then you fill out the market with smaller uh, footprints. Maybe if you're full service in your, your, your hub, your spokes might be fast casual. Or maybe it's just if you're a 6,000 square foot location at your hub, maybe you're a 2,000 square foot location on, in the spokes. Um, but the point is, is that it's a great way to fill out a market, to have that one centralized location um, that can really bring uh, that new market, uh, your brand's identity, can introduce yourself to that market, can get your menu out there, can, you, you can tell customers what you're all about. And then you go out into the suburbs and you you take your product to the people, essentially. And that can be also marketing for that one centralized location as well. Bodega, as Jared talked about, as they expand and as they have expanded to Chicago, they've developed this new prototype that is a lot more helpful to find real estate because it's a smaller footprint. They've taken the two components, the lounge and the taqueria, and, and opened them up a little bit so that it's a little bit more of a blended uh, experience versus the porta potty door that takes you to the lounge. Um, and it's helpful for them because, as Jared said, they want to do that hub and spoke. They want to try to fill out a market with some of these smaller prototypes, um, you know, and maybe in a city's suburbs. Um, but really, also, it just helps to open up the opportunities for real estate for you. Jared talked at length about, you know, the fact that what they're looking for for the lounge and taqueria combination their original prototype, it's hard to find that. They had to be very patient to get that real estate. But by having the secondary concept or or prototype, it it really opens it up a lot more. So something to consider that, you know, you might have one prototype, you might have one very specific idea of where your brand fits in a marketplace. Um, But as you grow, consider something where you might have that secondary model that takes you out to different locations in a market possibly the suburbs, and really helps you to, um, you know, find real estate a little bit more easily. My fifth takeaway is that non-traditional expansion requires careful alignment with other brands and partners. So Bodega is expanding in stadiums and arenas, as Jared explained. Um, You know, I recently uh, spoke with Claudia Lascano of Fuku, as I referenced in the interview. Fuku is almost exclusively looking at this space. Clearly a lot of opportunity as stadiums and arenas are really turning to especially local brands. They're turning to high quality brands. Um, But it's a very, of course, unique environment to be operating in because it's not open every day. You know, you might have only a couple hours on the days it is open. It's a really high pressure, high volume a very quick turnaround needed kind of environment. Um, But you could tell from Jared talking to him, he's really excited about the space. But the point that is so interesting, I think, is really this idea of having to align with these other partners. And even so far as to say the team itself, and is that team winning? Because that reflects on your brand. And as a Cleveland sports fan, I can tell you, uh, I I feel for all of the Cleveland arenas and the (laughs) restaurant operators trying to open in those spaces. But truthfully, you have to you have to pick those arenas and stadiums where you know you're going to be aligned with the team, the ownership, the operator in that space. Um, a lot that you have to think about, as Jared described, 
Um, you can't just jump at the opportunity because it's available. Think about who you're partnering with. Jared took that one step further, though, and I thought this was really interesting when I when I asked about this. He said, you know, it's beyond the non-traditional locations. It goes into your traditional locations. When you sign a lease, obviously, you have the landlord, you have co-tenants, you have, you know, the neighborhood. There are a lot of um, partners out there and a lot of alignment you have to do. All of it has to um, fit your brand. Because if your brand is in the wrong neighborhood and with the wrong landlord, the wrong partner, the wrong operator, all of these things can go south quickly. Um, so in all to, that's all to say that, um, you know, think about these things. If you have opportunities in these spaces, that's great. But look into who you're partnering with before you sign on the dotted line, because that partnership is going to be critical to whether or not your brand can succeed in that space. My sixth and final takeaway is that patience and discipline will pay off as you build your brand. Um, and that kind of goes to this last point, which is, uh, or to my, my previous point, you have to be patient and you have to be disciplined in your growth. Um, there are, are too many examples of restaurateurs who were not patient, who are too eager to grow, and it all just came crumbling down way too quickly because they just chased that fast expansion. Um, you know, Bodega's been around now for 11 years, as Jared talked about, and they've grown to 10 locations and they've got more on the horizon. But the point that he made was just how disciplined you have to be in that growth, how patient you have to be for the right location, for the right partners. If you're not, you know, again, there's too many risks that come by going too fast. And even when, you know, you might be just so eager to grow, you'll be rewarded for that patience. And, and Jared even mentioned, you know, uh, I love what he said about, you have to keep me moving forward. If you believe in your concept, um, you know, it's going to be tough. It's going to be, um, have a lot of challenges involved. Um, but if you believe in your concept, just keep moving forward, keep being optimistic with that patience and with that discipline. And the point he made that I really loved, that will be contagious to your team. If you're optimistic, if you believe you can win, if you believe this thing will grow and succeed, you just have to be patient. You just have to be disciplined and you just have to trust each other that it'll get there. Your team will believe that they will buy into that. And everybody loves winning, as Jared pointed out. So um, great words to live by. And I really appreciated that advice. Those are all my takeaways for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe to Takeaway wherever you listen to podcasts and leave your feedback. You can also email me at sam.okus at informa.com. Thanks again and talk to you next week.